and I keep looking for my Bible. Like, oh no, I forgot my Bible. And it's like, oh, never mind. Never mind. So, uh, you know, if you know me, you know I have a number of phobias. Um, tarantulas, I, I, hate, I hate them. Um, I actually got a tarantula that I now keep in my office just because I'm so afraid of them. And uh, if it, well, hopefully, you know, and it sits there, and whenever I'm doing my work, I still, you know, check back in the case to make sure he's still there. And he, sometimes he just sits there and watches me. He, you know, he gets his creepy little legs up on the side of the glass, and it's like he's just, I know they have terrible eyesight, I know that. But I swear, I swear, this one has 20-20 vision, and he's just sitting there staring at me. Like, one day, you're not going to be paying attention, and I'm going to sneak out the top, and I'm going to eat you. I know that's what he's thinking. You know, I, once again, I, I know that, you know, well, they don't, they don't think like we do, but I don't know, man. You don't know how this tarantula has looked at me. Now, it's just a tiny guy. But if that's what you're afraid of, it's a really big guy. And uh, so there he sits staring at me. Another thing that I'm afraid of, I really don't like planes. Oh, I really don't like planes. Just sitting here thinking about tarantulas, by the way, my, sweat, my palms are sweaty. Just thinking about it. <laughs> so that should tell you, I'm, I'm scared to death of these things. And as much as I'm afraid of tarantulas, I would rather hold a tarantula than get on a plane. Dead serious. Um, I, I have been on a plane before, but you know they just don't make sense. They shouldn't be able to fly. <laughs> They're too heavy. It's like if I ran really, really fast and jumped, I wouldn't fly because I'm too heavy. I don't have feathers. I mean, come on. But but you have these giant planes that hold a bunch of big fat people in it, and then you just push it really, really fast and it flies. That doesn't make sense. That shouldn't happen. It, it, <laughs> that 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 shouldn't be able to happen. And and to add to the anxiety, have you ever had a layover? Where <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> If you've ever flown more than like once, you've had a layover. And uh, oh man, y y there's this moment where there's a slight freak out, you know, where right before your plane lands, you have this kind of freak out and you wonder, am I going to make it to my next gate before it takes off? And then there's this other moment of, of freak out where you wonder, where is the gate? And you know, they have them in order. But there's that moment anywhere where you're like, I'm going to miss G, I'm going to go straight to Z or something. You know, so you're, 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 you're mad dogging all the gates and everything. You're, you're having, a, you're having a, a heck of a hard time. And uh, then there's, I don't know about you, but for me, there's this moment when you sit down on the plane where there's a slight panic. Am I on the right plane? <laughs> Obviously, they wouldn't let you on the plane. We know that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've seen Home Alone, guys, okay? I know that sometimes there's little kids who drop their tickets and they go to New York, okay? Bad things happen on planes. Um, and, you know, I just think that that's a perfect example for what we're talking about. We're talking about God changing our plans and how it can be very disorienting, right? When, when you have set in your mind, you know what's going on, you know what's going to happen, and then God just throws you this curveball and works completely different. I, I'm pretty sure if any of you were to talk to your 20-year-old selves, that your 20-year-old self would say, that's not going to happen. I've got it under control. I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to end up in that situation. Oh, if only you knew what situations you were going to wind up in. Uh, so, you know, sometimes God has us walk through shameful situations, things that are personally, we feel like people, everybody's looking down on us. Um, we see this happen a lot in ministry, and we talked about that two weeks ago. Um, and then sometimes um, God has us walk through just pain. And if you've been alive, which I'm hoping that all of you are alive, I don't want to have anybody die during my sermon. I feel like that would be a total mood killer. Uh, but uh, uh, so if you've been alive, you know, you've had to go through painful situations you didn't think you, you would have to. And we looked at that last week. And, uh, but sometimes God makes us take the scenic route in life. And we don't like that because, now, I want you to get this. I want you to get this so much I actually put it on the screen. We think in terms of efficiency. God thinks in terms of quality. And this is a difficult concept for us to grasp because we think, okay, here's a point A, here's point B. I'm just going to get to, exactly, I'm just going to get there. But God's like, okay, well, this is where you're going to end up, but I want you to do this, and then you're going to learn about this here. You're going to go over here, and it's not going to make sense, but in 40 or 50 years it will. And then and it's like, whoa, hold on, God, calm, <laughs> calm down with that. You know, uh, but, but this is, this is the, now, 
For those of you who are men, this is extremely frustrating because men, men literally have dreams about how to make something more efficient. That's what we dream about. It. That's, a, that's our bread and butter. We wake up in the morning and we think, how can I save more time and be even more efficient? We are like robots. Man, if there was nothing but men in the world and we lived forever, the world would be so well organized. We'd be like robots going around. The, the, this, the, this, you're wasting my business time right now. I have stuff to get done so much. There'd be no, con no, no, there'd be no conversations. There'd be no relationships. There'd be no friendships. <laughs> because in our perfect little world, we would, we would get rid of it. There'd probably be no lawyers either. Uh, anyways, anyways. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. We want things to be better, you know, and, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a certain process that goes something like this. We want things to be better, so we trust someone. Let's give a hypothetical situation. Let's say we trust in a politician. It can be anything that you trust in. And then that thing, whatever it is, uh, will inevitably disappoint us. And... You know, this is the exact same thing that happened to Israel 2,000 years ago. And for this, we're going to look at John chapter 6, verse 12 to 15. It says, And when they had eaten their fill, he told, he being Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley leaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the signs that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, this is where things start to get south. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew. So everything seems like it's going good. You know, his ministry is doing good. He has a good response. Hey, man, we had this, this widow's thing and all kinds of people showed up. Things are good. And then they get bad really fast, like really fast. Hey, you know, pastor, how about you be my king now? It's like, ah, I uh, don't know what, uh, what hall I walked down the wrong way, but evidently this is not where I wanted to be. And uh, so Jesus is kind of withdraws, and you can just kind of imagine um, the disappointment for those people who were, who were looking at Jesus. J just think about how perfect this was. Now, let me, let me lay a little bit of, a little bit of background. For, for the Jews, they thought that God's kingdom was going to come physically and immediately, kind of like Rome did, um, where it will just sweep over the whole world. And it would consist of a really strong military force, and they would just conquer the whole world. And they had this idea, which, um, I'm going to be honest, wasn't great. Not a great mindset to have. But uh, this was kind of their mindset. You know, hey, we're going to wipe out all non-Jews, and we're just going to rule the whole world, and it's going to be our perfect little world, and we're just going to kill everybody else. Now, <laughs> for us, we can see, okay, we're the hold on, there's a little bit of a problem with your plan there. Uh, but they're so hell-bent on this at the time of Jesus that the moment that they thought that he was, he was the one, they, okay, so let's make him king, let's, let's start doing this, let's cast the shackles of Rome, Rome out of here, and let's get moving. And, uh, well, obviously we know the end of the story, it didn't quite work like that, so you, you know that they're going to be disappointed. So you know that, and I know that, but they didn't know that. And... Uh, <laughs> Obviously, there is a physical element to Christianity. You know, we're, we're here and whatnot. But, you know, we are a people without a nation. We are a people without a home. We are wanderers on this world um, amidst people who are constantly striving for power. And uh, obviously, Jesus will return one day, and, and, and he will fulfill the fullness of God's kingdom. But it didn't happen like Israel wanted it to happen back then. They were looking for God's anointed. Now, I'm going to give you just a, a real brief lesson on some words here, just because there's kind of confusion, some confusion here. When we talk about the anointed one, this was an idea that, that the Israelites were looking for. They were looking for God's anointed one. Now, anointed one, uh, th there's a Hebrew word, Messiah. Well, you've probably heard Jesus the Messiah. Um, that wasn't his name. That was what he was. He was the Messiah, the anointed one. Um, and in Greek, this word is Christos, or Christ. Um, once again, Christ was not his name. His name wasn't Jesus Christ. He was Jesus the Christ. So, um, but, so they were looking for this anointed one. Now, an, an anointed one um, in the Old Testament can be a lot of different things. Um, it can be uh, a king 
A king was anointed to, to rule the nation, so in that way the anointed one could be a king. It could be a prophet. We read about uh, in the Old Testament specific prophets who were specifically anointed by God to be a prophet, like Isaiah, where he says, God, I'm, I'm unworthy, and so the angel touches his lips and says, okay, well, now, now you're good to go. You know, and, and so there, there's a good example of, of a prophet being anointed. It's an anointed one. But then also Israel as a nation was considered the anointed one of Israel. I mean, I'm sorry, of God. Um, in, that, in that sense, Christianity is God's anointed. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, ideas behind the anointed one. But behind all this, there was this Jewish idea that there would be a specific anointed one, a person who would bring relief to the nation. Now, yes, but not in the way that they were thinking. Um, he wasn't going to come as a king and show his military prowess and wipe everybody else off the face of the planet. He wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and they didn't know that. So there's a little bit of confusion there, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And, and then when Jesus died on the cross, that must have, for them, seemed like the, the, the proof in the pudding. Surely this guy was not the anointed one because he died. So obviously, you know, he can't be our, our Messiah. Um, and uh, Israel was really looking for for a leader to make them a superpower, not for someone to bring redemption. See, they were disappointed because they were looking for the wrong thing. They were looking for a superpower status, not for redemption. Completely different thing that they had in mind. Because they were looking for the wrong thing, they were disappointed. If they had been looking for Jesus, they would not have been disappointed. Just imagine how perfect that would have been anyways, you know, uh, if Jesus would have, would have become their physical king. Man, that would have just made things so much easier. You wouldn't have to worry about your kids being stubborn and not repenting and, and, and going and, and getting into drugs and doing stupid stuff. They would have been killed. Problem solved. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about, um, about your, your troops getting hungry when, you know, you go to conquer the other nations because Jesus could have just fed them with a single loaf of bread. You wouldn't have to worry about your troops getting sick when they went to war and got cut. Jesus could have just healed them. This, to them, they're thinking, man, we're going to have it made in the shade. We're going to go out and kill a bunch of people, and nothing bad's going to happen to us, and we're going to live in our perfect world. So, you know, we aren't Jews, and we aren't living 2,000 years ago. We kind of overlook what they were focusing on. Uh, but this is actually kind of a, a big part of the Jewish uh, faith, uh, at least at the time. And the real, the real confusing thing in all of this is that even though it would have been easier for Jesus to have done what they wanted him to do, he instead chose the mockery of the cross. I want you to think about how, how mind-blowing this is. This is why Paul talks about it being foolishness. Because... To us, we think, I have to watch out for myself. Who of you, if you owned, if you had money, would invest it in a failing business that you knew would never recover and you knew that they were getting ready to file bankruptcy and there was nothing you could do about it? Why would you still invest millions and millions of dollars into that company? Nobody would do that. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He died for people who could never repay him he wouldn't get anything out of that investment. That's like taking your money to the bank and having and paying them instead of them paying you interest. I'm going to give you my money, and then I'm going to pay you interest. Are you joking? They'd hop on that. Sure. Hand it on over. You just keep the money going. It's fine. Well, we got it. Uh, <laughs> another round of golf. Uh, <laughs> but that's not how Jesus did it. And that's just mind-blowing. He suffered for those who didn't ask him to. He suffered for those who didn't deserve him to. And he suffered for those who were making fun of him while he was suffering. Have you ever done the right thing and had people make fun of you for it? How frustrating is that? We have Jesus, God, made flesh, dying for people who are literally making fun of him. And then, it doesn't stop there, you have people on to today who are still making fun of Jesus, 
still using his name in vain, still blaspheming God and those kinds of things. Thousands of years later, and he's been patient these last at least 2,000 years, obviously before that, but I mean since Jesus came, he's been patient for 2,000 years while they sit and mock him. Do you have character like that? Anybody? No? I, I don't. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I would have been getting ready to go up to the cross and then one person laugh. One person would be like, that's it. Mm -mm. Angels, come on. Whew, wipe these guys out. You know, that, that's how we think. We think, let's get even. Jesus didn't. That blows me away. Um, the story of the cross is so crazy. It's just unbelievable. You know, a lot of people will say, tell you a lot of different things about how they'll always be there for you and how they love you. And all. Jesus meant it. He meant it all the way to death. I would say that's, that's the proof. You know, that's, I would say that's definitely some proof there. So this was a change of Israel's plans, and uh, one that they really didn't like too much. And, uh, but if God, imagine real quick, what would have happened if God wouldn't have changed Israel's plans? Imagine how disastrous that would have been for everybody. So sometimes God changes our plans because, well, because he's sifting. Sometimes God changes our plans because he's sifting us. And as he sifts, he finds a few things. The first thing I want to point out him finding is our impatience. Now, and the second thing I want to point out is our self-will, my way. I want it done now, and I want it done in the way that I've decided. Now, how many of you guys have gone to prayer with this mindset? Don't lie. I mean, come on. God, I'm praying for this. I want it done yesterday. I don't even understand why I'm even having to ask you, because you should have done it already yesterday. I'm a little bit disappointed that you didn't read my mind here. And then uh, the second thing, God, is, you know, I see how you might be doing this, and I, I'm not cool with that, okay? I don't want to see them in heaven. So you're going to have to alter your plans there, God, so that I only have my buddies in heaven and everybody else can just go somewhere else. I don't, you don't have to send them to hell, just, you know, not, not there, you know. And uh, so God kind of sifts us through this changing our plans. And, uh, <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. So as he finds patience, as he finds impatience in us, he starts working patience in us. And one of the things that we see with them trying to make Jesus uh, their king is that it didn't have to be done right then, did it? A lot of times we get real bent out of shape because we think this has to get done right now. And it's like, well, no, not really. There's very few things that have to be done right now. For instance, you don't have to eat. You can just die. You don't have to. Like, there's nobody pointing a gun to your head saying you have to eat your next meal. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there's a lot of things in life that, that we put so, such, uh, make it all, you know, real, real um, difficult for us when it's not really. And another thing that God works through is with the patience like, that we saw in this story was sometimes we're living for the wrong thing. See, Israel was looking for the wrong thing. And so God changed their plans so that they would start living for the right thing. Israel changed their plan so that they would see it doesn't have to be done right now exactly how I want it to. He was working in, in their impatience. He was working in their self-will. Just as he still is working in us. See, sometimes we define success wrong, and I'm going to come right back to that. Come, I'm going to come right back to that, so put a pin in that. And then it, with our self-will, so, uh, two things that I, that I saw from this story is the first thing, when God is using others too, not just us. Sometimes we think, if I don't do it, it won't get done. Sometimes we think, there's too much need and I just can't fulfill it. So we get discouraged because of all the need there is around us. When we aren't the only ones in the world that God's using. See, they didn't understand right then. Forget the disciples, forget everything. Just Jesus right now, he, don't let him die for our sins. Oh no, let's just have, appoint him as king. And he alone will, will, will solve all of our problems physically from, from being, I'm, I'm saying, making this sound bad, from Rome. Solve all of our problems with Rome, not 
yes, Jesus did come to save us. So the, I, know, I know I said that kind of weird. And then another thing is we focus on us and set the wrong goal on accident. See, Israel was all, all focused on themselves, so they set the wrong goal on accident. What was the goal? The goal was to kill everyone who didn't believe. Just go out and wipe them out. That was their goal, and it was the wrong goal. See what I mean? But they didn't know that it was the wrong goal. They were unaware that it was the wrong goal. Sometimes, sometimes we do this a lot. I'll give you just a real quick example. What is my goal as a parent? See, a lot of times we don't actually stop and ask ourselves that. What, what is my goal? How do I define success? How do I know if I've done it right? Sometimes we define our success as a parent by if our kids make all the right decisions. Now, don't say, no, I don't do that. You do, or at least you have done it before. As long as my kids make all the right decisions and I have retained bragging rights, then I have done a good job. That is the def definition of success as a parent. What if that's wrong? What if the definition of success is whether you loved your kids well and told them about God? What if their decisions are their own? Oh, God forbid it, let's instead guilt trip ourselves till the day we die. See, we have, la we have failed to define what it means to be a good parent. Therefore, when we miss the mark, because there is no mark, we blame ourselves for it. See, with God, he has a way of, ha of having us reanalyze our goals. Here's another thing. Sometimes, some of you will relate to this. You get real, real irritated because the house is, is dirty. Ever feel like that? Maybe, maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. I don't know. You know, honestly, I don't even care. Uh, you know, whatever, your house isn't clean or whatever, so you just kind of freak out a little bit, especially if you're like me. You, you start twitching a little bit, and you're like, uh, I'm going to go sleep in my office. <laughs> and uh, is life more than cleaning your house? And yet, we sometimes lose the goal, don't we? And we make it all about this thing. And if that thing is not fulfilled, we take it out on our kids or on our spouse. And we start acting not like Christ because it's okay for us to not act like Christ because they didn't do what they were supposed to have done. And once you actually stop and think about it, no, that's not really that big of a deal. But most of us, if you were to spend the time day with us, you would think that everything is a big deal. So your kids spill, beat them. Your, your kids accidentally say a bad word that they didn't know was a bad word. Beat them. Your kids don't put up their toys when they're done playing with them. Beat them. You know, it's like, okay, hold on. <laughs> hold, hold on, hold on. God has this way of sifting us and finding that impatience and that self-will in us. And, uh, oh boy, there's so many things that I'm not saying because it's just not the time. We do like to glorify ourselves, though. We like to uh, think that we know it all, and we don't like anything that makes us feel uncertain. Just a few quick things that I thought of when I was um, getting ready for this message. Are we trying to teach our kids to be adults, or are we trying to make them like us? Are we accepting our spouse for who they are, or are we trying to make them how we want them to be? See, sometimes we like the idea of a person, but then when they aren't, how we, they aren't acting how we want them to act, we try and change them. Some people even get married to somebody with the idea of, I'm going to change them. What if that's not who they are? Sometimes you just have to accept your spouse for who they are rather than trying to make them who you want them to be. Are you trying to get your boss to think like you, or are you realizing that you aren't the boss? Are you trying to surround yourself with people who act like you, or are you trying to serve those who are different than you? See, we don't have to try to be self, self-serving. That's just kind of something that happens naturally. We like to be around people who are like us, so we don't feel conviction at having to change. I mean, let, let's be honest here. How many of you guys like change? How many of you guys like feeling uncomfortable? How many of you guys like to say, hey, yeah, I was wrong? Oh, yeah, that's fun. That's my favorite thing in the world. And uh, so all, all these things, just, I want to close with this kind of little point here. It may take time, but when God changes our plans, he has better plans. We don't know because we're impatient. We don't know because we're self-willed. 
But God has his own plans, and they don't include wiping everybody out who doesn't agree with us. <laughs> they, they, they don't include, you know, trying to force someone to be our, our king when they don't want to be. <laughs> and none of those things. Um, God has a better plan, I said, not a different plan, a better plan. So uh, we're going to go ahead and, and close out there if you'll join me. God, I just pray that you would help us to be patient. And as you're working in us and through us, I pray that you'd help us to learn, um, first off, <laughs> that things don't have to be done our way all the time. And second off, <laughs> that we would learn to be patient, God. That we'd stop trying to set time limits for you to answer our prayers and then be disappointed when you don't answer it in our way and in our time. God, help us to be patient and wait for you. Help us to sacrifice our way for your way. And I pray, Lord, that you continue doing those things. And as we go through these trying situations that you, that you call us to, help us to be able to be molded like clay is before it's, before it's burnt. And, uh, God, we just, we just love you. And uh, we're looking for you to do something in, in these situations. And we love you. Amen.